<laughs> anyway, look, we could sit here reading uh, uh, reading comments all night. We probably yeah. ought to crack on with the show, aren't we? I think uh, I think I'll bring the first question up, and uh, I'll, it's funny, you know, while we're sort of on the topic of. Uh, people making donations what i've decided to do when, when people i know have you know contributed i just thought i'd put a little icon there to honor the fact that i know that they have in the past mm -hmm. just just a little thing so jimmy you know we can now yeah. say th um thank you because not we don't always remember you know um that's that's true but, uh, no, Jimmy's been uh, Jimmy's been with us a long time now, hasn't he? So, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, anyway, to the question, Jimmy. Yes. Um, um, Jimmy asked, uh, "Can we tell him much about the um, Nesha Ramla Homer or Homo Nesha Ramla uh, type recently uh, discovered?" <laughs> Do you know what, Jimmy? We've uh, we, we've included your question because, well, hey, rude not to. Um, but the honest truth is, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> it's it's an interesting one because uh, so basically, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, the uh, Nesha Ramla. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Nasha Ramla, but it's actually Nesha. Uh, it's named after the uh, the location of the discovery in israel which is just, so just the, south of tel aviv i believe yeah uh so uh, so nesharamna basically they found two pieces of uh, of skull um a piece of jaw oh, thank you ryan bless you ryan. thank you um uh, so yeah two pieces of skull and uh, and they've been thank able you. to discern that this is a previously unknown uh hominin um and it's been called the nesha ramla homo nesha ramla uh it dates to approximately 120 140,000 years ago don't know exactly how it sits in human history now the reason i say quite openly no jimmy can't tell you is because uh, the anthropologists themselves are not in agreement at all as to mm, what this truly is. That way. Yeah. The, there are actually uh, there are some geologists, geologists, some anthropologists uh, who think that this is actually early Neanderthal and uh, and might not be a separate species mm. at, at all. Um, so uh, all I will say to you right now is. That's as much as we can say. We know that they have found what they think is a new species dating from about 100, let's say 130,000 years ago. I hear 140 to, to 220 in that Where did, in you, that where did you And where did uh, you read se that? Several, several points. Um, Interesting. Uh, so, I mean, places. that just shows you quite how yeah. much uh, difference of opinion there is going on at the moment. Um I mean, it, it, it's interesting, it, whichever way you look at it, uh, I'm not going to dwell on it, Jimmy, for the principal reason that, that if there's that much argument going on between yeah. the experts in the field, then the rest of us aren't going to know anything until they've sorted their lives out. So that's, yeah, there you go. That's the two skull fragments that they found. Yeah. Um, and that's it. <clears throat> um, that mm. is it, indeed. Yeah. Um, but uh, but to see the context of... That that's uh, that's yeah. the two bits they've 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 found. Yeah. Well, just to, uh, to leave leave it with you, um, you know, go go searching for the uh, Nesha, Nesha Ramla, Homo Nesha Ramla, and uh, the most the headline is that they think they might have found that we've got three species that were not necessarily interacting at the same time, the, the, there is suggestion of that as well, uh, but we're alive at the same time. So we're talking about a time when we've got the Denis Denisovans, though not in this location, obviously. But in Israel, we do have the Neanderthals, and it is, it is um, uh, being mooted that the Levant is where the Neanderthals originated and that they s spread from there. And the thing is that they're looking about, you know, the possible interactions between this species, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens, 
uh, who may or may not have been coexisting in vaguely the same area at the same time. That's what's uh, exciting mm. about it. But further than that, I don't think uh, we are qualified to say. No, but <clears throat> when we do hear anything, then we shall report back. Indeed. Now, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that our special guest this evening has just joined us in the green room. And, uh, Excellent. He, he, I, ho I hope he's happy in there. And uh, we'll bring, bring you on, James, when uh, we come to the um, particular question that's been, that we think you'd be uh, <clears throat> qualified to answer better than we, what we no, are. No, I think you should rephrase that, that we know you are. We know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair <laughs> cop, fair cop. <coughs> okay, uh, on with the mm. next, Rupert. Okay, and it comes yes. from Ian. Ian yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Rosie. Um, uh, did we abandon wood in favour of stone for structures, or is it just the longevity of stone giving that appearance? Thank you. No, thank you, sir. Um, mm. Mm, there's a long and a mm. short answer. There's a very long answer to this, isn't there? And, uh, uh, and a, a very short, short one, answer. yes. <laughs> a very short one. <laughs> yep. Um, um, no, it's the second bit. It's just the longevity. The second bit, yes. The it's, appearance. It's, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Do you know, I think a good example to answer Ian here, uh, 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 for me a good example actually, is that uh, for some reason in Britain, uh, we find megalithic tombs all over the place, you know, whether it's long barrows or cairns or dolmens or, you know, whatever. We find these tombs. We find no houses, right? Now, we know that the houses, apart from Scarborough Bray, we know that the houses were timber. They're just all long since gone. Now, you go over to Eastern Europe and you have virtually no tombs uh, left, probably because they've all been robbed out and the stones have been used for farming or lord knows what but they have the remains of timber houses on a scale that you wouldn't imagine um yeah. and some of you will have heard us talk about this when we came back from the europa conference that uh, there were a bunch of archaeologists from hungary and romania who were giving their findings on various excavations and i'm not exaggerating promise you I'm not exaggerating when there was uh, one of the archaeologists was saying well we excavated 330 houses here uh, 80 here 30 here 50 here Th the numbers were insane and these were all timber structures that mm -hmm. they were excavating as settlements so I, I think culturally you you have to see it that yes in Britain we had timber houses and timber structures all over the place and it just doesn't stay in the archaeological record if there's high levels of humidity you go to places like eastern europe where there are some places uh, places where it is significantly drier and that's why it's still there unless it's peat bogs where it gets <coughs> preserved uh, like the sweet track but uh thank you thank Thomas. you Excellent. Very, welcome. very much. Welcome, um, welcome, welcome to Patreon. I hope you enjoy uh, um, being with us uh, uh, over there. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah. Do, do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Well, like? then, of course, you go up to Orkney um, and uh, Stone never went away because it, it's so readily available. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to think in terms of, uh, of materials. In a sense, you know, a megalith building was an anomaly. Um, it, we, we just notice it because we notice it because it, because it is still there. It's it, as you say, it, it's it's long, longevity that mm. completely <clears throat> skews our our view mm. of uh, what was going on. Um, mm. and, and and megalithic sites are few and far between compared mm. to you know how people must have been existing and how many mm. timber structures there must have been uh, you know, uh, up and down uh, uh, the country. I've just thought another another point uh, mm. on that though that doesn't get discussed very often, and that's if you think of the timber structures that we know about. So uh, you know, palisaded enclosures, for example, mm. and places like you know the concentric circles of timber posts <clears throat> at Stanton Drew, where you're talking about mature oak trees that were say a meter in diameter. Now, obviously, they made those for uh, serious longevity. Mm. 
reality. You know, they wanted those things to be standing there for whatever purpose. But in terms of simple structures, uh, so, um, uh, you know, imagine that you just took fence posts or timber walls. You know, mm. imagine that you split timbers and made big buildings you know you could i don't want to start getting into kind of the religious side of things because it's uh, it doesn't actually take you anywhere because we don't know but but if you were actually making walls you know if you were splitting tree trunks into planks uh then you know that's going to disappear from the archaeological record really quickly but we know that these vast timber posts were used in lots of places so what have we lost that were made of you know, finer planks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there must have been so much that has just all gone. I will just finish off by uh, casting this little uh, pebble in the pond, and that is, uh, I strongly suspect that uh, you know, <coughs> a lot of stone structures, stone circles, may have been simply there to support or you know to anchor <laughs> wooden structures. Yeah. Just a yeah. thought, just a thought. Yeah. No, and I agree. Before we move on, uh, Graham says, and then there's <clears throat> Arthur's stone is being excavated as well. So that's that's, that's three, three, three yeah. long barrows being excavated. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, well, I never. All right. Okay, let us move along. Um, so, uh, and it's uh, to Susan. Um, Hello, Susan. Yeah, who is uh, a Patreon, as you can see. And it, Susan's been very generous, actually. I have to say, thank you. Is there any way to find out how many workers died building Stonehenge type structures? Seems like a dangerous profession. Too true. A stampeding auroch or falling mon monolith. A cemetery nearby. <clears throat> I don't think we can spend very long really answering this because it's, it's, it's just too speculative for words. And anyway, the, the, there's a thing with so many questions. How would you go about finding out? Do you agree, Rupert? Totally, yeah. totally. What you know? What um, evidence would you need to uncover hmm. that would convince you that that was for somebody who had been killed in the process of making, you know, wherever you say Stonehenge? So you know, we take hmm. Stonehenge um, because uh, okay, you can find a burial. Uh, you know, there's plenty of burials at Stonehenge, but. Um, what but they, they mostly uh, predate. Uh, well, unless you're talking about the round barrows surrounding, which true, are yeah, different that things. Is true. But, um, yeah, but uh, but you know what could give you that information? Really, mm, it's mm. in fact, it, in many ways, it's it's one of the uh, one of the problems or one of the inherent difficulties with archaeology is that you can have a question, mm. but is there is there really any degree of evidence that would prove it one way or the other? What well, is there a method? Is there, is there a method you could uh, you could approach the archaeology with to discern that? That's that's the thing. It's designing how you integrate, integrate, <laughs> integrate. That's a good word. That's a good, we'll we'll run with that one. Yeah, it's designing <laughs> how you interrogate the archaeology to to extract this kind of question, and and uh, yeah. that's the tortuous bit. You know, that's the really fascinating bit. See, and, I, I think I, the only piece of evidence that would convince that you one way or not or or not with <clears throat> with that, you know, somebody dying at Stonehenge because <laughs> of it being a dangerous uh, occupation would be if there was a wily e. coyote style hole in the ground. Uh, yeah, you, you know where. <laughs> Yeah, where, where, where the stone had fallen on top of somebody and crushed them into the, you know. Um, of course, we have that at Avebury, don't we? But he's, he, but he was medieval, wasn't he, or something? He just... Yes, it was always thought that the stone fell on top of him. But I think yeah. it was Mike Pitts that uh, uh, that, that pushed it. Uh, put, what? <laughs> it was Mike Pitts that put that straight. That the, the oh. guy was actually uh, he was pushed under the stone. Uh, well, there's more than one possibility. It's possible that he was brutally uh, injured that, and yeah. crawled under there to hide, <clears throat> but he certainly died under the stone rather than it fell on him. Yeah, I'm going to swiftly move along. Uh, okay. I, hope, I mean, yeah. it's, it's an interesting question, Susan. It's just how how would you know? How would you know? How would we go um, about discerning it? Yeah. Yeah. So, if anybody's got any thoughts <clears throat> on how you might know, then do <clears throat> please shout. Now, look here. Uh, 
we're hey. very glad we've got to George Mann's question, who asked, hi, guys, how do you identify worked flint? I always pick up bits that I have my suspicions about. So stand by to get a, a great authoritative answer to your question, George. And I hope everybody in, from uh, our special guest uh, this evening, thank you so much for being patient, James, hanging about there in the green room. We'll be with you in a second. <laughs> Dr. James uh, uh, Dilly, who we know quite well and will never forget um, uh, his uh, generosity and, uh, and kindness in uh, uh, putting on a demonstration for our tour participants actually at Avebury in September uh, last can, year. Unforgettable. Can you put your hand on it right now? <laughs> yeah. James knocked that up in. Uh, Hold on. He said, waiting for Michael to put a light on. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, my little lamp has gone. <laughs> Excellent, well done. Yeah, it was on top on top of the Nauth. Um, on top of the Nauth Mace head. Uh, yeah, James knocked that up in uh, in half an hour. Was it half an hour, James? Is that doing you an injustice? Between Something twenty minutes like and half an hour. Yeah. It's just it was a breathtaking thing to watch. Listen, mm. let uh, let me uh, bring uh, James in. Hold on, I'll assign you to guest two. There he is. Hey. <laughs> James, thank you so much for waiting. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Great to hey, see no, you. Not good to see you both. Uh, How you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Um, we're, we're pretty busy at the moment. Um, we're going to be at the British Museum on Saturday for the penultimate day of the oh. uh, World of Stonehenge exhibition. Fantastic. Uh, what are you doing The there? launch of the Festival of Archaeology. So, uh, yeah, we'll be there doing a whole variety of crafts from napping to casting. And there'll be Graham Taylor there, who uh, is Potted History, oh, and okay. Sally yeah. Pointer, who uh, I'm sure some of your uh, subscribers watch her YouTube channel as well. So, um, and there'll be yeah. loads of other stuff on. So if you're mm. in London, and then uh, do, do stop by. Brilliant. Well, th there you have it, guys. Yes, be there, be square. Oh, you're talking about the Festival of Archaeology. Is that the Festival of Archaeology taking place at Butzer, Butzer Farm? Uh, well, it's for the British Museum are launching oh. their component of it. At, oh, right, uh, okay. <clears throat> they do it every year. I, I think they have a designated place that they launch it each oh. year, mm. but each museum seems to also have their own launch. So, Right. I Fair know, enough. To confuse to turn up. Yeah. Listen, to the to the question in, in hand, James. Um, what... Oh. Next... Let's go back one. There we go. Well done. Yay. Uh, how do you identify worked flint? Uh, there's, a, there's a multitude of answers to that, depending on what the tool is, I guess. Yeah. And um, after Rupert's email this morning, I was thinking about it during the day. How, how can I easily answer this question um, during the chat? with a, a somewhat finite amount of time because you know for yeah. people like myself and lithic specialists they'll, they'll spend days doing workshops where you'll sit there and watch a powerpoint that oh this is the ventral side and all oh, that's a, a negative scar and this is this and this is that and uh, yeah as you said there's many ways that you can answer that question and many approaches to answer that question as well um so I thought it'd be best if I just grabbed a couple of flakes and a couple of natural pieces, so at least then I can point to some of the characteristic features. Okay, terrific. I'll put you full screen, so, yeah. That, uh, well, ho hopefully it will so, show up uh, yeah. fairly well. I mean, I'll, I'll hold things close. So I thought yeah. I'd start with a really nice, obvious flake. Uh, it's one that I've taken off, um, and, uh, yeah, just work from there, really, and, and just get more difficult. I, my uh, webcam looks a little grainy with, with a little bit of... Uh, you're, you're all right. You're, you're all right. Okay. Uh, well, fine. that's fine then. It'll make my job easier. So this is a quite a large flake that I took off uh, probably a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, it's quite a large one. You're not often going to see flakes like this just hanging around, um, apart from maybe at flint mines or some of the Paleolithic sites. Um, so don't necessarily expect to come across flakes this kind of size too often. But the reason I've got mm. it... Is because the features that will be macro scale, a normal size flake, I'd really have to be holding close towards the screen so you can see it all. Yeah. So for the face that I'm showing you now, um, this is known as the dorsal side. 
uh, and the opposite side that's facing me is known as the ventral side uh, in archaeological terms. And I always try to remember that the dorsal side, uh, because it has the ridges and scars down the back, of, particularly the ridges, uh, is a bit like the ridge on the back of a fish where the dorsal fin is. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. that's about as easy uh, connection as I can make. The, the ventral mm -hmm. side, as I turn it around, is, is usually pretty flat and uh, generally fairly featureless in comparison, apart from some key bits around the top. In terms of what you'd be looking for, I guess, in, for the key features, uh, the ventral side should generally be uh, convex, uh, as you can see on this flake, as I tilt it around, so you can see that it's generally convex, although that's not a standard rule, um, because you can see at the same time for this flake I've selected, it is actually ever so slightly bowed, um, so <laughs> perhaps not the best example, but it's also <laughs> an example of these set parameters ain't very set. Um, so having certainly having ridges and scars on one side, but being pretty flat on the what, what you know ventral face uh, are key features. But as well as that, looking at the top where I hit it, uh, this is known as the platform. This sort of W shape here. Um, hmm. Sometimes I don't know if you can on this one, but put it really close. You might be able to see these fracture marks or these points of percussion. Yes, um, we can to bring yeah. it across. Uh, they can be a bit of a giveaway um, to, that something has hit it. And certainly on a piece like this, uh, it's had a couple of hits out the top. You have to excuse my dirty fingernails from being in the workshop. <laughs> uh, but you do get platforms at, uh, at two sides of a flake. So it's a, a bipolar removal rather than uh, a unipolar removal of a core. Um, and off that platform that's usually quite flat, but tilt it around a little bit more. So it's got a nice flat platform. Behind it on the ventral face, I've got this bulb of percussion. Uh, and you, this particular feature you'll get with anything uh, that has a conchoidal fracture. So flint, glass, obsidian, even baked porcelain, they should all flake in the same way. And they'll all have this set characteristic. Yeah. Um, is, is that a result of the way that energy travels through the uh, through the material through the yeah that's uh, that's very much it and, and because it's a, a homogeneous material i'm often asked oh does flint have grain to it but it doesn't mm. at all oh, okay um, yeah it, it's sedimentary um as a material it's actually bio sedimentary uh, build up of silica um that forms around uh, sponges sea urchins that's why you get all sorts of fancy colors and bits and pieces in flint mm. So I'll move on for that because that pale colour isn't the easiest to see, but I'll, I'll move on to an equally large flake, which has a fantastic bulb of percussion on it um, as I move it in, into the central area. And hopefully as I turn it and the light sort of hits it oh, wow. in different directions, I'll yeah. bring it back into the middle. You should be able to see that really obvious bulb on the side there. And certainly that point of impact on the top. So yeah, really obvious bulb. And as I turn it round really obvious impact point just off the side here um, mm -hmm. this flake is actually from Haysborough that we picked up off the beach um, <coughs> earlier in the year um, a bit really big paleolithic flake um, just a waste flake it hasn't got any retouch on it um, mm. but for me that that's such a big distinctive feature to see that a big heavy point of percussion big bulb off it and that does have that ventral face that is concaved as well it does have the ridges on the dorsal face, which is technically convex, but it's not so obvious. But for me, in that checklist, having two or three key features is usually a good sign. And those two or three key features is that it has a nice flat platform. It has a very obvious point of, uh, of strike, I guess, where the point where it's been mm -hmm. hit. It has the nice big bulb of percussion, and those are the three main features. It, it does have the other features to it, but the, those first three are quite recognisable. If you look at thinner flakes, um, so this is a flake from Grimes Graves, um, from uh, the later Neolithic um, mines there. As I hold it up in the middle as well, you can see it has a much, much finer platform, but you can still see it has that quite distinctive, almost half circle. I hope mm. my camera will focus a little bit better. Well, let's see probably got it in the other flake but you should yeah. be able to see that slight half circle as yeah I try and work, line my finger up so we've gone over the platform it's already got that 
um, and it's got that uh, bulb of percussion as I turn it on its side. Get the line out to my camera because I'm working in reverse. You can see that bulb of percussion on the back. We've got our ridges. You can see from previous flake removals, they're on the dorsal side and it is technically convex and the really, really fat, flat rather, ventral mm. face uh, is indeed, so I'll move my fingers, concaved. So we've got all of those distinctive features that the scars uh, and the ridges are on the convex side, the dorsal face and the flat. And sometimes, again, whether you can see these as I move it in the light, um, you sometimes get rings of shock that go through the stones oh, of me casting yeah. my eye across to see if I've got any other flakes that show it a bit better. Uh, not so much. <clears throat> relying on light a little bit so the, those i guess for flakes are the key features um, but those are what to look for and really it, it takes practice um i mean ju just to give an example um but during the day when i had a bit of a break walked over we've got some fields near us that have a lot of neolithic uh, and bronze age activity on there they're, they're i think by they local landowners are hoping to develop on them so hopefully it'll be a big excavation at some point but a fairly short <laughs> walk over said fields pr produced those again very recognizable flakes that you can see the flake scars on the back that mm. dorsal face yeah. and uh, that is the convex side and the ventral face as i turn upwards you can see very flat um, and concave yeah. and it does have that platform at the back as well um, keep moving this yeah, around yeah. just to see if it will focus in but it, it's i guess being able to recognize that kind of consistency and having a feel for it and I, I would definitely say that there's a lot of value um in if you get the chance to handle in either replica work mm. material um or the ancient stuff itself because the manufacture method is exactly the same and it will start to give you those distinctive characteristics that feel that you'll get used to um, and certainly if you're if you've had any experience napping you can see work flim from a distance you really can it, it just sits in a certain way it has a certain color to it sometimes mm -hmm. um, depending on the local so i brought some um some naturals just to i guess um go okay. against um what uh, what i've been uh, already look, looking at and talking about so i've got this piece of flint here um which for all intensive purposes, could easily be a Paleolithic flake. It, it has a sort of flat top to it here. Just about here again. Yeah. Bit, yeah, yeah. As it catches it. Um, really flat top to it here. It's got the ridges on what would be the dorsal face, so it's, it is convex again. Um, it's got the um, curved uh, ventral face, and it has, in fact, got... Uh, a, a few ripples on it um any other features on it not really that would tie it in but it, it could easily be a flake but it ain't it, it is totally natural it, it just doesn't quite have the scars in the right direction but it there is that feel to it as well and, and this is where that lithics specialist would come in that I, if someone brought this to me and said i think i found a flake i i would totally understand why they'd picked this up it, it does have three two or three of those features that uh, are there to identify so that that was that would be a really tricky one and could understand why someone picked that up but i'm often presented with um things like this uh, which uh could be a hand axe uh, on first glance it's got a couple of what appear to be removals down the side it's got a bit of a point to it um you know if you hold it quite uh, securely in your hand, you could sort of use it as a bashing implement, um, and that, uh, I guess, stance of holding flints like this. And I'm hoping you're not going to capture a screenshot of me sort of looking determined. <laughs> <laughs> could do, could do. So, well, I wouldn't put it past you two, um, but um, th th that is often a situation I find myself in. It is I've got this stone tool and uh, it, it's got a point on it and it, it fits so well in the hand um, that you could see someone using it as a bashing instrument or, or something like this. And it, it fit, fitting well in the hand or, or having some chunks, flakes taken out of it, um, 
don't make it a stone tool because by that logic, a banana fits well in the hand, but it ain't a stone tool. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. The, the amount of times I'll get messages and uh, you know, I'll have people come up to me at events that I found this. You know, I, I'm pretty certain it's a this, um, a hand axe or, or or some other really impressive tool, and uh, you've got to be that person that. Uh, breaks the bad news and does it, most people take it yep fine you're the expert you know you're, you're used to this up but some will really hold on to it yeah. oh, don't you think it could have been sort of used like this or the absolute classic is well could someone in the past have picked up this natural piece and used it which is yeah how, how do i how do i answer <laughs> yes. that and uh, yeah, the, <laughs> The likelihood is almost certainly not, um, because you know, un unless unless you literally just needed a stone just just to clobber something, as we might do in the modern day today, you know, you'd make a tool that uh, it fits the purpose. As you showed, Michael, with, with the axe I made, that that was flaked in twenty thirty minutes. Yeah. So it's not a huge investment um, to go into making something like that. So if you needed something a bit more precise. If, mm -hmm. if you had the experience, it can be made with fairly limited investment. So you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't put up with using a, a natural piece of flint, you know, ju just because you know, yeah. it's a sort of useful shape. And I guess from flakes, actually looking more into tools, um, which you're less likely to find, um, but it does happen. Um, I guess what you're looking for in, in the types of feature is how the flakes look on the surface. Um, not just a piece of flint that's sort of been nibbled around the edge where it's been knocked about in the ground. So for a very small lump of flint like this, um, it has just had a single chunk taken out the side of it. And it's not a sort of notch tool or anything like that. It has just been bashed against another stone at the beach through attrition. Um, and any kind of field damage like that will generally not be very invasive across the surface. So they won't be very long flake scars. Um, I'll always be slightly jealous of this, but M actually found uh, this uh, at Haysborough. Oh, um, yes. It's a, a very, very little hand axe, um, but um, it, it is probably a piece of Neanderthal work. And uh, she recognized um, that, I mean, it was just on the floor. She didn't have wow. to dig for it, no, nothing too tricky. But as I start to turn it, this side is a little bit more patinated, but you can start to see in the light the flake scars and how they're quite distinctive across the surface. So you can, certainly as I hold it there, you can really see the ripples of that yeah. flake just above my finger that's, there. That, that's um, quite beautiful. Absolutely turn, fascinating. I'm just going to say, uh, hold on for a second, uh, James, because yeah, yeah. I have to apologise to people. Um, I've lost my ability to see the chat um, in, in my uh, I've, uh, app. My, my chat has frozen. For, uh, for yes, it, it has. So I've, I've just had to <clears> hop <throat> over to uh, YouTube to see if there's anything catch, to catch up with. And I apologise to anybody that's asked a question, you know, has made a comment that... Uh, 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 may have merited um, uh, a, a response uh, from John. I'm just scanning it, uh, the, the chat now, to see uh, if if there is anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, just one moment. Yeah, <laughs> Nigel Sadler says uh, I don't think I can bring this on screen. No, I can't because it's 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 not. In the, it's in the wrong place. Uh, Nigel Sadler says it only takes 20 to 30 minutes to knock out an axe, but you need 5,000 hours of practice to do so. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, true. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad he said that because I, I, I didn't really give you that full uh, an introduction, uh, James. I mean, I know you're known to quite a lot of our fans, but, you know... Oh, well, no, that's, uh, I think it, you, you, you gave me a... a, a a good introduction, so uh, it's appreciated. <laughs> there, there yeah. is a link uh, down below in the dis uh, in the description to uh, James's uh, website, Ancient Craft, uh, and you'll see yes. there the the massive background and and but he, I mean you know James has a doctorate out, out of this. Um, the experimental archaeology he does is invaluable uh, mm. to. Um, 
from educational purposes, but also to academia I itself, you know, when discerning these things. It's, it's one of those things where you come across, it's all very well, you, you tell it best, Rupert, uh, but it's all very well uh, trying to work things out from behind a desk, but uh, actually getting things done, getting your hands what, dirty and what, hitting... What, you mean Bruce Bradley? Bruce Bradley, yes. <laughs> Bruce Bradley, yeah, our friend Bruce Bradley, the American uh, archaeologist, yeah, he always says uh, about hunting, really, and uh, the people who analyse... <clears throat> whatever about hunting techniques and he said it's amazing how many people write papers about uh, neolithic hunting and paleolithic hunting when they've never even so much as gone out and shot a rabbit um and uh, it, you know it's it's just so true you know that mm. you need you know it's like james's experience hands-on working with stone to give you that understanding of what the potentials are within it you know there's only so much you can glean from uh, you know it's mm. that old thing of you could read any number of books on how to ride a bike it doesn't mean that uh, you're going to be able to ride a bike when you get on it mm. Um, mm. it's that really Do you know what talking about your various skills james i'm willfully changing the subject here but i couldn't help but notice the nebra sky disc on the shelf behind you and wondered if it was one that you'd knocked up yourself yeah just, ah. just casually casually knocked up but uh there we go you can uh, see it in uh, all of its glory so uh, 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 and you... seeing, seeing as the stonehenge exhibition is is coming to an end um, yeah then yes um, but so uh, yeah made from uh, hammered hammered sheets of bronze um yes. and uh, it's uh, m it's actually m who did the gold work on this um, oh my is god it? Yeah. <clears throat> So, uh, no, uh, I, I, I like the fact that you put the uh, the other arc on the uh, uh, <laughs> on the left hand side of it. So oh, here's, good grief. here's the thing: you haven't been tempted to do the Great British Museum uh, Stonehenge exhibition heist, then. I've got a story to tell you. I've, I'm really, Dang, yeah, dangle in. I can see you dangling you, in above the, uh, you know, the it, glass. It's not quite as dramatic as that, but uh, we and, and uh, if, if anyone on, in the chat or in the future from the British Museum watches this, I'm sorry to begin with. <laughs> so what what I'm about to say might might. Hi Jennifer. Know. Hi hi. Yeah yeah. Neil but just. Duncan, just Duncan, yeah. No, just skip forward the next next bit, please. Um, em and I went in to uh, the BM for the members' evening, um, and we did a living history display um, up on room thirty six, which is above the entrance. Um, and we had a few hours beforehand, and uh, they let us in to the um, exhibition to have a little look round. And we had. A load of the replicas with us because we were about to display them so i had the nebra sky disc <laughs> m's been working on the folkton and burton agnes chalk drums um God, as, alongside everything else so we thought well what you know why don't we take them in with us because we can get a picture of us standing next to the actual thing so i'm sure you can see where this is going um <laughs> so um, and i thought well we won't won't walk in blazingly i'll just sort of have it in my bag because, you know, you don't want to be just wandering around drawing unwanted attention. Um, and so we went up to the, the chalk drums first, so and could uh, get the picture standing next to it. Um, and uh, Julian Thomas was standing in front of us and uh, sort of talking about it. And um, David from uh, David Dawson from Wiltshire Museum appeared behind us and said, oh, hello. I didn't expect to see you here. And then, and Julian Thomas turned around and said, oh, oh, this is a bit strange, isn't it? So we were standing there in front of the chalk drums, M sort of wanting her picture, but had the chalk drums there. Then they realised the chalk drums were there. Security started to think, what on earth is going on here? As we were trying to take this picture of the three of us. They couldn't work out how the drums worked. Also, in the case, but case? there's one out of and... the case. It's, you know, it's, there's so, something going on. It's a bit like that meme of Spider-Man and the three Spider-Man sort of pointing at each other. So it's very similar. And then we made the mistake of once we said uh, <clears throat> goodbye to them, of uh, we, we know you can't take a picture next to the original Sky Disc, but you can take pictures of everything else. So yeah. we thought, well, we'll take a picture of me with my Sky Disc next to the rest of the horde. Um, and some of the other things, because it's the highlight object. 
I got it out and then took a picture and a member of security came over and said, um, you can't take pictures. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. And there was a person right next to us taking a picture just with a normal camera of yeah. something else and sort of gestured. You know, this person is also taking a picture. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, uh, you can't take pictures of the disc. We're not taking pictures of that disc. Right. <laughs> so are you doing this for commercial reasons? Well, for social media, Medium. we're not going to sell this. It's our one. Ah, uh, uh, well, you can't do it. Uh, okay. Well, can I speak to your superior, please? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go and get my superior. Superior floor manager came over and said, "Are you taking pictures of the disc? <laughs> we're not taking pictures of that disc, but..." We're taking pictures of this disc. Here's one we no made earlier. This is mine. We, well, what we made, this is ours. And they're like, ah, oh, okay, so you do it for commercial reasons. No, no, we, we're actually here working at the museum tonight. And, you know, and uh, Neil Wilkin was taking a, a group round. We said, you, you can go and ask him if this is okay. But he's yeah, quite the, busy. The curator. Group, but yeah. You, yeah, you can go and bother him if you like. Oh, uh, hmm. I think I'll go and get my superior. You can go and talk to them. So the gallery manager eventually comes down and says, oh, hello. Um, so what's what's going on here? And, and sort of introduce myself. Oh, yeah, pleasure. I've come across you before. But, so what are you doing? What's the problem? And superior, superior said, they're taking pictures of the disc. After the second <laughs> time, we're not taking pictures of that disc. We're taking pictures of our disc. Oh, okay. I'll tell them not to bother you. you. You just carry on. And so they went off and these two slightly despondent members of staff in the distance could be seen being somewhat berated with very defensive sort of stance <laughs> as we were sort of yeah. flashing the disc around. But uh, yeah, that's the closest we've come to the actual uh, disc heist to continue its quite uh, <laughs> heist. Thank you. Not quite a heist, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for that. that we, is, we were just trying to continue it. Yeah, that is brilliant. Thank you so much. James, and thank you so much for, for joining us. You're absolutely right. welcome to uh, uh, st stick around. Uh, we don't want to impinge upon your time. If you want to get off and, well, was, and sit on the sofa, that's fine too. Anyway, so I don't, I don't mind... So, but if you want to absent yourself, uh, click the little red button that you can probably see. Uh, when, uh, yeah. But uh, uh, you're very welcome to stick around. And but for the moment, I shall move on to the next question. Thank um, you, James. Yes, uh, and if you've got any input coming on, as I say, uh, visit uh, the link down uh, below to find out more about James and uh, his work and where he's appearing and uh, um, uh, stuff coming up. Um, and, and indeed, if you want him to uh, knock you up a few uh, a few replicas, uh, James's yeah. shop is uh, is oh James quite a great shop. Yeah, it's closed at yeah. the moment, but uh, it? we'll oh, be yeah. reopening. Twenty fourth right. October, we're aiming for. We, we will be adding mm -hmm. some some new and exciting things, and I guess to whet appetites, we might be adding things like this. <gasps> Oh, oh come on! Oh, you see, there's a waiting yeah. list for a Ferrari. That's much more exciting yeah, than a Ferrari. Well, that, that's yeah. why I keep making them. Because eventually, I'll be able to afford a Ferrari. <laughs> one, one about that. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, I uh, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting the the uh, comment feed back. I don't know why that went away. Anyway, for the time being. Anyway, I'm going to move on. I'm going yes. to. Uh, uh, you're still with oh, hello, us, Matt. James. So, anyway, uh, yeah, Matt, uh, Lazzie McLand Rover. Um, any update on the Soskin configuration <laughs> of the yeah. two circles within a circle? Uh, Matt has been uh, dying to know. Yeah, uh, Rupert, uh, what can you tell us yeah. about the uh, the Soskin uh, configuration? Uh, uh, thank you for remembering, uh, Matt. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. I I stumbled across it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things you say by chance, but no, it's not by chance because we're looking all the time. Um, it was just one day when I was looking at uh, arrangements of Avebury, actually. And so you've got a big stone circle with two circular structures within <coughs> it. So these are two circles within a henge, basically. And then I realised that, well, hold on a second, that's what, uh, that's what the Hill of Tara is like. And... 
Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that's the Hill of Tara. And then when you start looking, well, there's no calling. Um, oh, well done, Mike. They're actually in order. Fantastic. Uh, so they're, um, OK, different scale, but you've got two circular structures uh, within the uh, this the bigger structure. Uh, and uh, it, it turns out it's a thing. Uh, Navan Fort. Navan Fort is a very famous one. As far as I'm concerned, the archaeologists have got the dating completely wrong with that's that. That's another story. Um, all, yeah. Although <laughs> that's a boat rocker for everybody. Um, uh, you know, that it's mostly talked about in Iron Age terms, but I think it's sitting on a Neolithic, you know, much earlier structure. Anyway, um, uh, now this... I think even more interesting because this is actually a lidar image of a Barrow Cemetery in uh, oh crikey is it Hampshire or Somerset? I think it's Hampshire. Sorry, um, I'll help you. Uh, yeah, academic. But there now these circular structures. So they're uh, you know they're burials, but these circular structures are way way smaller than those other henges. But once again, you have circles with two circular features within them. Now, for whatever reason, I spotted this because I was looking for things in a separate context. Um, it seems that no one has actually picked up on this before. I've asked various archeologists who've all said, oh, that's a very interesting observation. Um, nobody seems to know about it. I can't tell you anything else about it. Um, because I'm <laughs> I'm not in a position to actually pay people to go and excavate to uh, prove something one way or the other. The other <clears> thing <throat> is, what question would I ask? Clearly, it's a thing. Two circles within a circle. It's a thing. What that might be, I can't imagine how we would actually... Uh, I, I don't know what question you would ask to, uh, to point you in any direction there. Um, so, Matt, the honest answer is no, there's no development, but it's not going away. Uh, you know, we, we will continue to kind of poke the wasp's nest um, and see if we can get uh, any, of the, uh, any of the big boy archaeologists to, um, to be interested. I'm yeah. sure Tim would be interested if he wasn't so busy doing other things. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that, James? Does it mean it's a... Um... Um, not... I guess not so much other than I, I have come across it a few times um, with uh, certainly some of the sites you've already mentioned. Um, and as soon as you, you brought up Avery, um, as well as the two uh, circular structures, you've also got the, as Josh Pollard did, I think uh, on Digging for Britain or a similar program, a mm. reference to the sub-rectangular structure that they came across in geophysics as a squircle. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, a uh, squircle, yes. Yeah. I think Mark. Yeah. Oh no, Mark said it was. Uh, oh, we found what we think is a squircle, and Josh turned on on camera live and said, "Oh, I think you can get cream from Boots for that." In uh, <laughs> classic Josh style, live on TV. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it seems that's the kind of archaeology I like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the 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 squircle yeah. predates uh, the other stuff by a good thousand years. As uh, yes, uh, I, yes, uh, yes. yeah. Um, it does. It does. But yeah. Memory, but it, anyway. it's it's just um, it, it's interesting that it appears, uh, you know, with that LIDAR image, you can see that it, it's something that does appear on much smaller structures as well. So uh, I don't know what that might tell us, but but the point is, it's clearly a thing. Mm, uh, mm. So, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Matt. You know, when we do find anything out, we'll let you know. It's... Um, yeah. Yes, the wheels of prehistory guys grind. <laughs> they grind very slowly. <laughs> they grind exceeding small, or whatever the mm. quote is. Anyway, um, mm. so we have another question <clears throat> from uh, Jim Cook this time. Um, cup, cup and ring marks. I mean, that's another lovely one. Have, you, have we any ideas about what we think they might be? Could they be a Neolithic religious symbol? Um, are they found in certain areas where more Neolithic relics are found? I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's another biggie, actually, uh, Jim. I mean, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people 
uh, all over the place with an awful lot of thoughts. And of course, it, you've ex got to extend uh, this whole thing into <laughs> the area of uh, general thing of rock art it, itself. But as for cup and ring markets uh, markings, it's it's a good idea to keep it narrowed down to that for the uh, um, for the uh, for, for the time being. I tell you what, um, best to so people who may not know what we're talking about, just give a few examples here. <clears throat> um, that uh, is from uh, Achenbrech, which has got massive examples uh, all over the uh, the hillside up in uh, Kilmartin Glen uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, it's another site only barely a couple of miles away from Achenbrech called uh, Ken Barn. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, here's an interesting one. Um, Kenny Brophy could tell us all about this. This is a, a small detail from the Cochno Stone, um, not far from uh, Glasgow. And what else have we got? Um, that's Achnebrech again. Um, that's Achnebrech again. But different and, ooh, view. And, oh, look, uh, who's that? When Michael had hair. Um, a beard by the looks of it, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, at um, uh, at uh, Ken Barn, yeah. While we were filming, yeah, the standing with yeah. stones. Uh, uh, where where do we want to go with that? I mean, cup and ring marks. You find them. You know, You're a bit off centre. Or, You're leaning out of frame, Rupert. Just so you know. There you go. It's only going to help, though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I mean, they're just they're ubiquitous. You find cup and ring marks. Markings uh, just everywhere, and uh, I don't have an opinion on what they were. Um, I I don't know about you guys, because uh, one of the big problems is that you you look at this. Uh, Mike mentioned you know Achenbrech, where there is this huge rock face, uh, you know, on a slope um, that is covered in these uh, these markings. Uh, I mean, how big is it? It's probably oh, 40 feet by 30 feet, something like that. It's huge. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the thing is that, you know, you look at these things, and, and it, it, the problem for us is that it, the, when, whenever we look at things, we see them as, if you like, a finished piece of art. But the, the, the simple fact is that, you know, this is something that could have developed over a thousand years, two thousand years, a century. We just don't know, you know, that it could have been something that culturally, um, you know, people would come along and, and do it. It could have been something that people came along en masse and it was a big, uh, you know, uh, engraving party mm, where everybody mm. did it all at the same it Just there's no way of knowing that. Mm, mm. Um, and, uh, you know, all right, there are a lot of theories about ritual aspects and maybe they were for... Uh, holding water, you know, holding rain so that the sky reflected the stars in them and things like this. But mm. when you've got something that's on a vertical rock face or on a heavily sloping rock face, well, clearly it's not that. Mm. Um, so I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're quite, I quite interesting things. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to go, Michael? No, no, no. No, you get in there, um, James. Yeah, I'll, uh, another one to add to the sort of Achna Breck and others from the Kilmartin area is Ormaig, uh, O-R-M-A-I-G, um, that's near Old Portalach. Okay. Um, and that, that's one of the best I've seen for quite some time, and it's been found um, in the last 20 years, so it's pretty fresh surface, but incredibly complex. It, it oh, makes yes, Acne Breck look yes, very yes. basic in comparison. Um, but um, interestingly, the, the, um, the cut marks take about 90 minutes to make um, as uh, Hugo Anderson Weimart did uh, quite a few experiments with uh, chalk pebbles um, quite, quite a while ago we now let's get Hugo um, Anderson Weimark on you know really. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we've tried on, we'll keep yeah. trying we'll keep trying sorry James go on. Well, no I'm talking to him at the moment about uh, another project so I could I could mention it to our twisters oh do kick him but, on our behalf yeah kick yeah, him because yeah. he said he'd come on and then he just we never heard from him again so uh, yeah well I'll be, I'll be a bit lighter than that otherwise it'll never come on but um, <laughs> yeah so uh Hugo found that the basic cut marks don't take very long 
Um, yeah. And interestingly, archaeologically, they're quite sterile locations, um, other than smashed up chalk pebbles. Uh, and it was suggested, as we've met a lot of other sites, that these chalk pebbles were quite important as offerings. But the chalk pebbles were the tools for actually doing that. Right. Chalk quartz pebbles um, for the uh, actual making of them. But other than that, they're, they're pretty sterile. Uh, mm. But one of the best suggestions I've come across, which I think you can see on the interpretation board at Achnebrek, um, is that the um, the concentric ringed um, cup and ring marks, uh, one suggestion is that it may represent a sperm and egg. Mm. Mm. Which, mm. which immediately comes with problems. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that'll be uh, it. That'll be it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to see that Neolithic microscope that they used to uh, work that one Me out. Too. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Other good places for, I mean, in, in general, uh, as far as um, cup and ring markings, Northumberland, uh, and there are quite a few on Ilkley Moor, I do believe, uh, Yorkshire, uh, and mm. uh, elsewhere. And there's a couple of others I can't think of. Must uh, go up north and, and visit the Badger Stone is a good one, on the middle of, in the middle mm. of Ilkley Moor. <laughs> we did have the privilege, Rupert and I, of uh, being in the presence of Aaron. Is it Wat Watkins? Isn't it <clears throat> Watson? Aaron Watson um, on the same yeah. tour uh, that ended up at Avery with with James. Um, we were at uh, Achnebrek and uh, got a very good talk from uh, Aaron up there. Another intriguing aspect, certainly as far as Achnebrek is concerned, that they have found masses of um uh quartz white quartz uh ar around them and uh the supposition uh, is that the um actual carving was actually being made with uh the quartz stone so there's this fascinating imagery of people in the dark sort of making these things in the dark and there being um illuminations from the percussion uh, sparks and percussion and uh, luminescence mm. uh, as uh, if that was part of it as a kind of uh, magical you know there would yeah. be a magical aspect uh, to it so that's another little bit of I intrigue so i don't think mm. we should do uh, any uh, much more on on that um <clears throat> we should think about uh, uh moving moving along anything more you wish to add rupert I can see you're no, mesmerized just by the chat. The, uh, yes, um, I'm looking I can, at the chat I can see. And, uh, <laughs> Con Con Condide says marbles game is my favourite theory. And uh, it, yeah, certainly if any of you have actually seen the Cockno Stone, you look at that. And, uh, and the thing is that, that there were people, the last time they uncovered it, uh, Kenny Brophy was telling us that there were people, you know, you're talking about people in their 80s, 90s, yeah. whatever. And they said that, yeah, when they were boys, they used to play marbles on there before yeah. they covered it up. Yeah. So I th that's a lovely idea. Yeah. <laughs> you, once you've got that idea in your head, you, you, it doesn't go away. You can't, no. you can't unsee it. Hello. My, my camera's gone off. Is that your camera gone? Ah, do you yeah. know what? The view's better already. Oh, thank you so much. There we go. <laughs> For some reason. Ah. I'll, I'll switch to camera number two, shall I? <laughs> Hey, you have the technology one. Oh. Yeah, um, I do. Never mind. Um, the trouble is that you have all the technology, so you're the only one that can put up the next question anyways. <laughs> yeah, it is true. Uh, right, let's see who uh, that's uh, that's from. Ginny X. <laughs> How are you doing? Hello. Ginny X, looking at the sophistication of Gebekli, Gebekli Tepe and Karan Tepe, 10,000, 12,000 years ago. It kind of makes much later megalithic sites a little less sophisticated. Were we in the UK, a rural outpost that had to wait more than 5,000 years or so uh, to get the builders in? <clears throat> uh, well, there's, uh, <laughs> there's your actual long and short answer, isn't there? There, there, there is, yeah. Which ones yeah. do we want to take? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well I suppose it's, the, it's you that wants to get back down into the village square for the rest of the party. So you know, take your <laughs> take your pick. Well, do you know what? I think the more important answer, actually, I mean, all, all joking aside, uh, <laughs> Jeannie, is that um, it's not just Britain 
that was in a megalithic doldrums for 5,000 years. You know, megaliths didn't tip up anywhere for another however many thousand years. Yeah. The, whatever culture it was that um, constructed Gebekli Tepe, and okay, Talk amongst you yourselves, could argue, I'm just about to at attempt a mid-broadcast battery change. Oh, the man is fearless. Um that uh, you look at other sites in Turkey uh, or in that part of the world generally, really. I mean, take places like Katlhoyuk, for example, which is not megalithic. Uh, you know, these huge uh, structures of, uh, I don't know, whether it's mud buildings, they're, they're hugely sophisticated. Um, completely different style. But the point is, you could argue that because uh, their, their periods overlap, we know that cattle uh, you know, there's 9,000 years, 10,000 years. Uh, so it is it's possible that these are cultural overlap. It's possible that, uh, you know, that the people who built uh, Gebekli Tepe were, uh, were, were the people who were living in structures like you find at cattle Hoyuk. We don't know. Um, but, uh, but megalithic culture across Europe generally is way later. Um, and you can uh, you can bring any number of arguments into play with that. So you know what happened to bring about the demise of the peoples who who were building places like Quebec Tepe. And you know there's theories like the cosmic air bursts, where a comet doesn't actually make impact with the planet uh, where, with the Earth. It just goes through the atmosphere and explodes without without actually making an impact. But it would come. It would be like a you know nuclear bomb it would just completely destroy everybody uh wipe out all life in the region uh you know but no damage to find on the ground no and there are there is evidence of more than one cosmic airburst around that sort of period of time so maybe maybe but you just don't know uh so the straight answer is yes there was something pretty sophisticated going on in that part of the world ten thousand years ago and they just disappeared, um, and uh, and everybody else took an awful long time to get big rocks going again. You know, there's an interesting point to make about uh, these kinds of cultures, though, and that's if you think that humans have been humans for a very long time, we've been very sophisticated as animals. We've you know we've been the same animal for a very long time, but every single culture that you can think of has existed within the last 10,000 years. All right, Quebec, mm -hmm. you can push it back another thousand or so. But generally speaking, every culture you think of uh, within 10,000 years. So what might have happened in, let's say, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, where people were still pretty damn sophisticated? You know, you look at some of the jewellery made by the Denisovans, who are, you know, long gone with beautiful jewellery. Well, if you're capable of making beautiful polished jade bracelets, then you're probably pretty good at doing quite a few other things as well. But no evidence to see for any of that. So, you know, I think there's an awful lot of stuff that we just don't know. It's just been lost, uh, yeah. lost such, to the archaeological record. Really. Such a gap. <clears throat> mm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you question, think about it, it, how how much, and it's it's foolish in a way, how much we rely upon the existence of stone monuments to trace people. It goes back to um, yeah. you know, the, the earlier question, and it's a fool's errand. Yeah. It, that really doesn't tell us a story. They're just flashes in the pan. You know, mm. there's these uh, wonderful ideas that probably spring up very quickly, and it's <clears throat> also a fool's errand to go looking for any kind of evolution of stuff. Hmm. Human beings are so capable. Once you get an idea, boof, it's there. <laughs> uh, and if, if, you know, then what are you laughing at now? <laughs> so it's just saying human beings are so capable. And I was just looking at you and me and thinking about a conversation we had this morning. And thinking, mm, yeah, yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Anyway, you you know what I mean. I I have this thing that things appear appear and disappear very very quickly in the record, and and we shouldn't waste our time looking for evolutions of of, of things. It's, it's mis misleading. 
Yeah. Um, yeah and I can't, I can't remember. There was a comment actually that that sort of inspired me to 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 say that, and and I can't remember where it was. Forgive me, forgive me. Um, yeah. No, sorry. Carry on. Carry on. I'm, I'll, All right, I'll catch up. Uh, but I'll, you know, it, uh, I'll catch uh, up uh, later. Uh, Matt has said, like the Tunguska event, for example. Yeah, mm. exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah, mm. Is what I was talking about. Yeah. All uh, right. Yeah, go on. Well, shall we move on? Yeah. Boom. Oh, Steve. Hello, Steve. Uh, uh, hi there, Steve. Um, thanks for this. Ah, uh, yes. Stonehenge exhibition observation. Um, like you, I was very surprised at how small the Nauth mace head and its cousins were, which added to their beauty somehow. Yeah. The star car eye holes in the antlers also seemed to be far smaller ahead than I imagined, which led to an observation of all the Bronze Age daggers and swords, the handles of which are very small indeed, all of them. If, even if they were made to be ornamental, surely they'd still fit a hand? So how much do archaeologists know the stature of Bronze Age persons? From what I saw, it got me thinking... Are we six footers? Are we the giants of uh, the, of myth and legend? Sorry, I didn't read that very well, but uh, we get well the, enough. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> I think there's there's one thing. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's there's one thing I want to clear up uh, uh, straight away, though. That's not really relevant to the sizes of things. It, it, you you mentioned Steve the Starcar eye holes in the antlers. They're not eye holes. They're probably where it was tied on. Um, it's uh oh you're not going to tell me you've got a replica of that as well for god's sake james um <laughs> fantastic uh so yeah those holes oh. they would probably uh, um sorry hold, would... um, <clears throat> hold that up oh, again you... hold that up again because i wasn't oh there we go yeah fantastic <laughs> uh, <laughs> so i was going to try and show a photograph that's yeah. in the uh thing. no that's not uh, that's not it is it yeah, those are uh, so yeah, uh, if you yeah. if you think how they would have been used, I mean the, the, that the the the, the <laughs> antler frontlets were probably worn with skins, uh, quite yeah. likely, and that was just that was how they were secured. Mm -hmm. on. But um, but apart from that, size wise, do you know I thought about this, and I thought the uh, the, the best way to illustrate uh, this really is that uh, you might think I'm strange. I like a knife. I have knives for all different occasions um, uh, because I do a lot of stuff outdoors. And here is one of my knives that I use a lot, right? And uh, and here is another that I also use uh, a fair bit um, because it's just <laughs> good for cutting little pieces of, you know, whatever. And, do you know, it's... I mean, I jokingly said with the the Nauth mace head and its uh, its uh, sister one, which I just think is the most beautiful thing ever, the one that's got the sort of tear not teardrop eye the kind of eye shaped, uh, in, you know the one I mean, Mike. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I referred to them as toffee hammers. It just made me giggle. Um, uh, uh, but I, I think that that's the one. Oh, God, that is just such a phenomenal piece of work yeah. um but the, but the fact that, that these it, things it is, it is if i put my fingers in it is it's yeah it's that it's that <laughs> that's size quite, that's kind of that's come on james have you got a replica of that there not yet <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, it, it, if it's not obscenely expensive, I'll buy one off you at some point. It's most. I think that would be obscenely, obscenely expensive. expensive. It will be obscenely expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, all joking aside, uh, Steve, that we need to be very careful uh, with interpreting size uh, to mean something. We can't conflate. Uh, these kinds of things, you know, um, mm, mm. Uh, you, you can go back to um, even medieval uh, swords, for, for example, where the sizes of the handles, uh, handles, the pommels, um, uh, you know, that some of them are ridiculously big and some of them are ridiculously small. It was all down to 
uh, fighting techniques, uh, how people wanted to balance them in the hand and things like that. So I, I, I don't really think we can, uh, we can look at size as indicative of um, uh, the size of the, uh, the user, put it that way. You no, put... and I was also going to say, and perhaps James, you can speak to this a little bit, is that a lot of it may have to do with availability of materials. Like I'm presuming the availability of uh, uh, bronze itself, the raw materials for bronze itself, uh, you know, th th these were precious uh, items and protect precious materials. <coughs> and if you could make something in a smaller size that did the job or performed the function, you know, be it uh, or em emblematic or symbolic or what have you, then it would make sense to make a smaller one with the materials you've got available. Do I don't know. I, from... yeah, I think that, I, I know what you mean, but I think mm. that you'd change the blade length before you change the hand length. You'd want it to be comfortable in fair, the hand. If it, was an, if it yeah. was an inch shorter in the blade, it would be academic, so long as you could hold it properly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, say. I guess, compounding the different parts of the question in that the now mace head is made from quite an unusual kind of flint, which doesn't occur in very big pieces um, mm. from Ireland. And there have been yeah. suggestions that that sort of um, whitey, browny, orangey colour of it um, is to mimic some of the antler mace heads, uh, which also have spirals on them from, from elsewhere. Um, so as, as you can see for the picture there, you, you've got a, a texture which could look a, a, like worked antler. And uh, there are examples from the UK. There's a fantastic example in, I think it's West Stone, of a Neolithic antler mace head um, mm. with very, not, not quite as ornate, but very similar. Um, there is on display in the world of Stonehenge, and I think it's from one of the Willsford burials, there's a mace head very similar to the one I have here, but it's, it is tiny. It's, it's really very, very small, uh, mm. much smaller than the Nauth mace head, but beautiful, really fantastic piece of stone. Mm. Um, and the, I think there, there is that, um, element of having a, an unusual material um, yeah. when it comes to mace heads, regardless of the size. And it, it's quite interesting that as you get into the early Bronze Age, for some of the mega sort of battle axes you get are made from the most, I wouldn't say rubbishy material, but, but <laughs> aesthetically not interesting whatsoever, <laughs> but they're whopping great things. They yeah. really are lumps, um, whereas the really tiddly stuff is quite <laughs> fine. But for the Bronze Swords, I... The, the balance you've got is that for the first kinds of swords, for, for rapiers and as you go into early leaf swords, swords haven't been made to a level, uh, w without being too dismissive of Bronze Age metal workers, people were learning what makes a good sword. Um, so for Bronze Age sword, for the replicas I make, apart from the metal pommeled ones, they just have wooden scales that are riveted in place, a bit like uh, Rupert's knife, uh, that's very similar, but with a wooden pommel which there's plenty of evidence of, that will make the sword very top-heavy, which is one way of fighting, certainly if you're fighting from horseback, which we know that people could ride horses and had bridalry furniture, so you know it's not too ridiculous to go that far. Um, but right at the end of the Bronze Age, you get metal pommels, which will start to balance the sword. So as well as people starting to work out what makes a good sword, you've got the fighting style, and certainly if you've got a very small handle that might suggest small people, it might be down to an over finger grip of the uh, actual handle to get that bit of extra leverage on the handle, and which is a style that you'll see with well, not up until the recent day, but certainly uh, l far later in time with some of the uh, short handled. So, I mean, look at some of the Saxon swords and sparfers that are really thick pieces of steel but very short handles and almost no pommel, so they're extremely top-heavy um, and would require that over-finger grip to provide that um, extra leverage. So you've got a balance, really, um, mm. but I, I don't think it's necessarily as straightforward as because everything's little, the people were little. There, there's so many other factors involved, but there mm. probably wouldn't have been huge amounts <coughs> of the population of the six foot at the same time. Mm. You, you, you did have people who are over six foot, but they were probably mm. less common. I've lost access to the chat again, so uh, forgive me uh, if we're missing I'm, anything. I'm looking at it on the pop-out chat. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, which uh, so Lynn says, so are you saying size doesn't matter? Um, it's how you use no, it. no, Lynn. Um, I would never say that. Um, uh, I think um, <laughs> let's not um, go there. <laughs> um, uh, I think we should move no, on to on. Yeah. we. We should. I just want to pick up because, in fairness to Steve, because he he's commented back. Oh, he sure, says, sure, sure. Uh, he said true. I don't know what you were saying was true. True, Steve. Uh, but he said true, but the handles were barely three fingers long. Uh, yeah, I, I think, well, as, as James just said, you know, that if you've got, depending on how, you, where am I? Uh, depending on how you're actually holding the blade, you know, that, you know, that there's all manner of ways of doing that. The other thing is actually to get to the crux or the end of your question. Uh, where you said were we the giants, uh, you know, of myth and legend? The other thing is that uh, if you've seen the, you might not have seen the photographs. Um, uh, when we were filming uh, the the stuff that we've been filming for our long barrels. I was just film. about to say, yeah, well mentioned. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Have you got something there? I can't. Um, read, no, because, I haven't. Sorry. Okay, it's a shame. It's just we were filming. Uh, we were lucky enough to have the uh, uh, one of the skeletons and uh, and other bits and pieces from the Hazelton North Long Barrow excavation. Uh, so we had the most complete skeleton from that excavation, and that chap was taller than me. Yep. Now you might say that's not hard, <laughs> but, but he was he um, was eye to, he, he would have been eye to eye. <laughs> yeah. Um, Green so, uh, so yeah, we. Um, oh, he uh, was. He would. He would have been eye to eye with me. That guy. He was yeah. laid out on the thing, but uh, he, he yeah. was substantial. Um, yeah, mm. uh, the flint napper guy. Mm. Uh, there he was, yeah. six thousand years old. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, no, nice question, Steve. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. uh, 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 do you know what, James? It always makes it an interesting chat when you come on. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, cool. <laughs> Let's give Abby Sue a hearing. Hello, Abby Sue. Archaeologists and others tend to talk about our ancestors honouring their dear honouring their dear departed. Do you know of any talk in academic circles about how to distinguish between loving, honouring burial sites and ritual human sacrifice sites? To clarify why I ask, firstly, there's the new technology so we're all excited about, along with the new hypotheses about cultural practices and new ideas about how populations spread. So why should human sacrifice be considered as being practiced elsewhere when it could have emerged anywhere in the family tree? Discuss. <laughs> you can start. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, a it's a really... It's a good question. It is a good question. Uh, I, I think that uh, depends which cultures you want to look at. Really, mm. if you're uh, you know, if you're going to sacrifice uh, somebody, all right. So you've got people like the male <laughs> who are a little bit mental, um, uh, where you know if you're going to be uh, ripping people's hearts out of their chests or cutting their heads off or what have you, um, that kind of ritual slaughter you know that's clearly not what you're going to find in burials if you're asking you know you, you mention uh sacrifice as opposed to uh loving burial so from that point of view you're you know i, I mean the, the closest kind of comparison i can think of is uh, is when you look at some of the inca mummies for example where even young children were sacrificed um and even now, you know, where they just look like they're asleep. I find some of those Inca mummies to be deeply moving. You know, I've got, uh, I've actually got one photograph of one girl who was probably about 12 years old, and she just looks like she's still sleeping. Uh, so, uh, so <sighs> how would you tell the difference? If you're just looking at bones in the archaeological record, you know, and the, so they've got no uh, no butcher, okay, butchery marks. You see, if you've got somebody who was stabbed as a sacrifice, and we'd look at them and say, well, butchery marks, or they died by violence, uh, how would you interpret whether one was sacrificed or whether it was killed in a fight? Um, don't know. But, 
good question. We do have some evidence there. I mean, the bog bodies are pretty clear, uh, a lot of them, as being uh, sacrifices. Isn't that not <clears> so? Uh, <clears throat> that's I, I can never make up my mind. I, I, I don't have a problem with any of the theories, but I... Uh, I've always looked at the bog bodies and thought, well, is is that ritual or is that execution? You know, was that just a you know was that a robber, a brigand, and they dispatched him? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Um, uh, you know, how would you know? You can't know. Um, no, yeah, I, uh, don't, I, I guess don't... that's where. You... Oh, no, carry on. No, 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 you. Oh, I was just I was just going to say that's where you get that problem with. Um prehistory and out, out of that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle of all the answers and culture and language and colors and all the rest that we've got five bits that are left to, to work with yeah. and it's, it's quite hard to interpret <clears throat> i mean for the things like butchery marks it's what what are butchery marks uh, is it are okay. yeah it's, is it marked to show removal of flesh to preserve flesh to make it easy to cook or is it just marks that show removal of flesh? Because that one of them only shows that you were defleshing a body, not butchering mm. for cannibalism. And yeah. there's certainly evidence from the Neolithic that people were intentionally defleshing uh, people to expose their bones that they'd then yeah. uh, enter yeah. into tombs. Or they would leave them um, for excavation and all the little bones wouldn't be represented because they'd get mm. lost mm. in the platform and dropped out. So, which can look very mm. brutal, or would have looked very brutal, um, but clearly was done with a lot of care and reverence. Um, mm. So, uh, a very, mm. very difficult one to answer. Yeah, uh, David says, David Potter says, Lindo Man. And also, oh, what was that site um, yeah. up and down the da- Danube somewhere that we're, we're from the uh, linear band ceramic period that uh, seemed to have shown signs of... Um, um, Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. of uh, butchery and um, cannibalism. Senior moment. Senior, Senior moment. moment. Yeah, we did a yeah, thing like, like um, <clears throat> many years ago. Just uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, uh, I don't not remember. One associated with Lepensky Veer, is it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, not no. Lepensky Veer. No, because no, uh, no. they've got no. they also very unusual trapezoidal the burials. So yeah, it's yeah. Different. It, it, you're right, mm. though, Rupert. I mean, it is one of those questions where, where, how do you interrogate, you know, wh- what's there to, to find out to make yeah. the, make yeah. the difference? In my mind, uh, uh, you know, the, the vast number of burials that have made, you know, been made with reverence of some sort, uh, you know, w- with varying gre- degrees of tenderness uh, uh, around them. There's, uh, there are a few. That we know, you know, that uh, where blunt force trauma might be involved, but um, mm. y- y- yeah, I, mm. y- I I think it's it's one of those cases where <clears throat> we've got good general evidence for uh, reverential burial practice, and in human history, although it is there in it. It's prominent when it happens. It is still, you know, a minority activity. Uh, the, the slaying of, of human beings deliberately and, and uh, brutally and, and overtly. So the evidence is going to be scant. Um, so you're not going to mm. see uh, progressions, like I was saying before, you just you know you're just not going to be able to join up the dots. You'll you'll get examples here, there, everywhere, but you won't be able to join up the dots to make a a general consensus uh, of it. Um, I hope uh, we're not really answering um, your your question. Well, you it's know. more that it's an interesting discussion point, and it's yeah. in many ways it's unknowable, um, yeah. and it's one of those things that, that in this instance, it, it doesn't make it irrelevant to ask the question because it, yeah. it is fascinating. There's a, a bit of chat uh, between uh, uh, Kev and Wildflower that um, mm. uh, Kevin mentioned uh, a girl who drank some narcotic drink and was sick down her front. I'm not sure which one you're talking about there, Kev. Um, the <laughs> photograph I was referring to that that I have uh, somewhere, um, uh, or it's a mummy that was found. Crikey, 
I don't know, 50 years ago, <clears throat> uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, who, uh, uh, yeah, no no vomit on this one. So uh, uh, it's not to say it didn't happen. Clearly it happened quite a lot, probably. <laughs> um, it's It's just a really interesting thing. You know, when you get loving sacrifice, uh, it, it does open up a whole different way of thinking, you know, that uh, can you imagine as a parent thinking that you are, uh, that your child is being honoured because they are being sent to the gods ahead of time, that you think that that's an honour. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, despite I, I think we really should uh, move on. Um, we indeed, are, indeed. Are quite um, late in the Thanks evening. for that, Abby Sue. Rupert, you still not got back down to the party in the square. I uh, haven't. My uh, wife will be looking at her watch. She doesn't wear a watch, so she won't be. And we um, do she's have, probably enjoying herself far too much and not even notice that I'm not back here. And we do have a couple of questions to still to, to get through. So <laughs> forgive me if I press on. Andrew. Hi there, Andrew. I haven't seen you in the chat, but thank you for the question. If agriculture began independently in numerous regions across the globe, does this not imply that humans may have been doing it much earlier than we currently think? My point mm -hmm. being, why would it take 200,000 years before people across the globe started suddenly having aha moments, all within a relatively small period of time of each other, which happens to be just after the last ice age? I think that's a flipping great question and probably you know it's another talking point that yeah how, how do you go about it, it, except that it's um sorry i'm not gonna say it's a, a, it, so well, sorry the, you, the supplemental to Andrews, <coughs> it, he said perhaps on. agriculture isn't so rare a discovery as we credit it but rather an inevitable product of sustained favorable climatic conditions I try to be pragmatic, but in this case, my pragmatism leads me to a romantic idea. Could we have had forms of agriculture during the Eemian when the climate was not dissimilar, uh, dissimilar to today's climate for well over 10,000 years? Seeing how far we came in 10,000 years of favourable climate conditions, it seems probable to me that our early ancestors could have gotten to this first step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I and I, I'm in total agreement, Andrew. I think if you're going to look at the um, the Eemian uh, period, so you're talking about 130,000 years ago, roughly, um, that, uh, the, yeah, I, you see, the, the, I think one of the things that you, need, you need to be really careful about when, when we talk about agriculture, uh, in fact, it's uh, uh, not an argument that we have, but it's something that crops up a lot, is that people take offence when we refer to people as hunter-gatherers as if we're saying that they're primitive. It's not, it's a choice. Um, that, uh, you know, you can have a, a good sophisticated settlement, take Gebekli Tepe as an example, no evidence of agriculture around there. If you can go out with a couple of mates and you can, if you're, you know, you're experienced hunters, you can go out and you can bring back in a single day, you can easily bring back enough meat to feed 200 people. Um, uh, if you are so Nat uh, Natufian toast, we did an article about Natufian toast um, uh, a couple of years back. So the oldest known toast, 14,000 years old. Um, and it's not from established agriculture. It's people going out and harvesting wild grain. Uh, you don't need uh, the sort of industrialized, wrong word, um, formalized farming that we've known about it for the last couple of thousand years. You don't need that. Um, you know, if you've got people who are happy to go out, uh, you know, you've got swathes of wild grasses on that field or on that hillside over there, that just going and bringing back enough wild grain uh, to make breads of, of whatever sort and what have you. <clears throat> um, you know, it's uh, the reason we got into industrialized, I've used that word again, formalized farming uh the way we have is because of population density getting to the point where it became the only way to manage things um when populations were smaller completely unnecessary don't need the aggravation keep the choice go and pick some fruit instead much more fun mm. if you see what mm. i mean 
Yeah, um, you make a really good point, actually, Rupert. And I think <clears throat> it is to call pre-agricultural people hunter-gatherers is completely and utterly misleading as to what they were mm. actually doing and how they were forming, how they were gathering together uh, and creating, you know, community, society, and how they were operating. It, 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 hunter-gatherer gives this illusion uh, of people that were having a, a um, what's the word? A completely direct relationship with their environment, and I think still think the people that we call hunter gatherers were actually in quite good control of their environment, given they didn't have formalized, for, you know, formalized agriculture as we think of it. You know, the, the wheat mm. thing, uh, etc. Mm. Um, mm. It's just a thought. Just a thought. Um, mm. uh, and I don't want again. We're we're we're. Um, <laughs> we are late in the evening, uh, and there are a couple we of are. questions to go. So we, we, it's, we I mean, what I'm saying uh, is, it's, it's a talking point that could go on, be a on forever. Difference. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the tricky bit is proving whether it's actual farming or just gathering. Is is all I'd throw in there. That that yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Thanks so, for that. Um, that's a good question. Thank you so so much. Yeah, um, forgive us for uh, moving on, which we must do to uh, <clears throat> uh, Steve Bull Number Nine, otherwise known <laughs> as Kez, to us on Patreon. Hi there. Hello, Kez. I think you're there, actually. I can't uh, see in the chat, but n never mind. Thank you for being a patron. Can you speak to why there is an absence of megaliths, stroke dolmens, <laughs> excuse me, stroke barrows, <coughs> <coughs> etc., in some areas of the UK? Growing up in between Birmingham and the Black Country, for example, there were several nearby hill forts, but not much else. Were they wiped out by industry, or did they just not exist in the first place? <coughs> Um, there's a bit of both going on there, but um, mostly this is to do with geology, isn't it, Rupert? And availability of raw materials. Uh, it is. Um, but uh, at the same token, um, you know, where uh, Kez is talking about, uh, where, you know, I mean, Birmingham, oh, man, there's stone up there. That I think that you, you've actually hit the nail on the head. Oh. I mean, number one, yes, there are plenty of places, particularly in the east, where the equivalent monuments, to use that word deliberately, uh, would have been made with big timber structures, you know, great big tree trunks and blah. Yeah. Um, equally, there are, you know, we've had thousands of years now of people taking those big lumps of stone to use them in farm walls and whatever else, because, you know, particularly, yeah. you know, long barrows is a good example, you know, forget dolmens, take long barrows, that why go out into the fields trying to find stones that are the right size to make your walls where someone has very uh, accommodatingly left you from a few thousand years ago, left this mountain of uh, of potential wall building material you know they're just that's why so many structures have disappeared um and in fact less so uh in britain than here but you can go to you know if some of you will have seen the film we made a couple of years back um called dolmens of the longer dog and mm -hmm. we went to all the sites down here near where I live. And you can go to, there's one Neolithic settlement where there's still a fair few dolmens and what have you to see. But you walk through farmland to get to it and you see these old derelict farm buildings that have got, I mean, there's one in particular that the back wall of this ruined house has got, you know, what was probably a capstone just making up the back wall. It's like, well, why do I want to put 300 stones there when this one will do the job? You know, it's uh, it, it just it stares you straight in the face that, well, that's where they went. Okay. Um, and in fact, I, do you know what? I'll give you another example. You go to um, Menantol in Cornwall, and look at the farm walls all around there, and it's like, well, that was a whole megalithic city there that's all just been relocated to the farm walls. Farm walls. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So that's uh, yeah. for me. That's why there's a lot of places in Britain where there aren't any, is because they've just moved those stones a few hundred yards away. What's the megalithic site uh, in Manchester? <gasps> oh, um, it's it's uh, it's in a park now. Or something. Oh no, it's it's been it, moved. It's, but it, it's rema- the remains of a of a, a huge burial. Again, um, you know, moved about a bit. In, I don't know if it's relevant to this conversation, um, but uh, yeah, you just uh, you just wonder. Um, but like I say, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, obviously, there are parts of the country where there is no the raw materials aren't there. You know, I'm talking about over to down in the southeast, uh, uh, particularly, and you just don't get uh, stuff. Um, not. <clears throat> Just don't get the megalithic stuff at all. Um, it's great no. stone you're thinking of. Is it? What? What did you say, James? A natural erratic, the great stone in Manchester. No, no, no. It was housed oh, in uh, in one of the parks um, for for a bit, and I think it's it, it's got a special been put in a special uh, installation now. It's got. It's they're wonderful stones. They've got. Uh, couple, it, it they've got a, is, rings. Isn't there? Isn't there something like a garden center or a cafe or, or something? Just mm, it's, 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 it rings. It rings something. a bell. But there are cup and ring yeah. markings on these yeah, stones. Yeah, Manchester. Uh, yeah, in, in Manchester. Um, I can't find it. Um, anyway, <coughs> academic, academic. We'll spend academic, ages yeah. debating that one. Call the stones, <laughs> Graham, Graham, Graham. Oh, that's in Liverpool, well done. Manchester, Liverpool. Of course, call the stones. Yeah, oh, thank you, not Graham. far away. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know, it's not um, far away, Manchester. I, I well think done. I think we should sometimes. I just think we should uh, set up this show for some of our fans to run it because they know more than we do. <laughs> Actually, we should just <laughs> set it up, get them, the get them online, and 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 go, <laughs> go and have a drink, go down to the Blue uh, Square, and uh, it, yeah. Uh, I I think we should move on till the last uh, question of all. I'm sorry, I'm still not seeing comments uh, too well, so forgive me if uh, we're not uh, uh, addressing stuff as we should. Oh, there's still two questions. Um, Kev, stone circles. We're with stone again. We're megalithic again. Henges and megalithic structures across Britain have no commonalities, similarity, etc., have do have commonality similarity does this point to the disparate tribes having some tribes having some kind of common cultural element e g animal husbandry religion uh, etc yeah yes well, moving on yes <laughs> it 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 probably <laughs> does and again it's another perspective to look at everything through and see what comes up see what uh, comes back at you once you make that uh, start to make that inquiry. Uh, it, it really, really, you mean it probably does? No, come on, it does. It well, does. there are so Why many are other going, elements like... to it as well. Like we said before, you know, the avail- the availability of uh, of um, um, raw materials, uh, the commonality of the basic structure of the circle. These kinds of things. Once you get a straightforward idea in the head, that then you know people run with it. Um, but it, it, it do, does speak to. Uh, you see, I mean, so many monuments are actually really defined by the type of rock they're made out of. That you know that may appear. Oh, that's a cultural difference to that megalithic site. Well, actually, no. You couldn't possibly make that site from over there. Over there, because. Your, your stone your quality of stone is totally different. You can make a. So you're uh, saying yes, then. A, you can make an analog of that over there, but it probably wouldn't look the same. It'll probably look like it's been made stylistically different. Tinkinswood. I mean, mm. look at Tinkinswood, and then look at Arthur's Stone. Look at Tinkinswood, and then look at Stony Littleton. But you know, boom. but it is. But it, but it is a it, it is a cultural commonality, though, isn't it? That's the point. Cultural you know? commonality, you, it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, well, that, that's the point of the question, isn't it? You know that. Uh, so, if you've got, you know, Stanton Drew in the south of, of Britain, you've got Long Meg in the middle of Britain, and you've got the Ring of Brodgar on Orkney, 
They are yeah. more or less equidistant from each other, and yeah. they are uh, they're within the top ten. I can't remember where is Long Meg something like the seventh largest in Britain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Ring of Brog is the third largest. Stanton Drew is d- d- depending what characteristics you're including, but you know but it's either the largest the... or the second largest. You know, it, 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 but so yeah, common analysis across. Yeah, definitely cut. Comments. Yeah, definitely. But different. I mean, Ke- Kevin, you, you, I mean, re- really speaking to one of the great quests of prehistoric archaeology, it, it's tracing uh, the developments of, of, of cultural influences. You know, in which direction they travelled, how did they travel through time and and space? You know, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, you know, um, the grooved ware travelling down from Scotland and ending up at Durrington Walls. You know. How much and genetics uh, has a, a lot of the answers as well. In that, yeah, hunter gatherers were appear at the moment to have been replaced by Neolithic farmers within 200 years, yes, which mm. is uh, you know almost mass slaughter time scale. I and mean, it's not, we don't have the evidence yeah. to support <clears throat> that, but there's a massive, massive cultural shift. And I guess mm. that even harks back to our question about um, the spread of agriculture. People yeah. are moving an awful lot in prehistory and moving ideas. But in, 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 to some extent, the ideas are moving quicker and further than the people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the Cotswold Seven tombs themselves. Mm. You know, what 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 cultural influence ha- had those be generically the same? You know, that, mm. that they can be so grouped together. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I I fear we should. Move on. We should move the on. End but, of I, the but, show. but I'm going to say, in my opinion, uh, then yes, it is intercommunication between the tribes, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, mm-hmm. they did. They yeah, come and have a so, party at my place. They did. We're moving on to another question that uh, tests us to a certain extent, doesn't it, uh, Rupert? As so many questions, uh, this yes, evening has. Um, we wanted it's, to answer it, but it's it is, to be fair, slightly outside <laughs> our remit. Um, However, Benjamin asks, hi there, Benjamin, uh, thanks for the question. I read something about Minoan writing being as yet undeciphered. Does this make Minoan civilization prehistoric by default? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it is good. I know, though they were engaging with each other, culture, they, oh, I know, though they were engaging with each other, cultures that did have writing. Sorry, there's a, yeah. <laughs> Are there any symbols or forms of writing that haven't been decoded yet? And what are the thoughts and developments in this beguiling area? Hmm. So, Rupert, you have devastating news in this area. <laughs> devastating. Well, um, it's, it, uh, the Minoan text is interesting because uh, Minoan, so we're talking about Bronze Age equivalent broadly. So yeah, Graham, uh, Graham goes immediately is in there, says uh, Linear B. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there you go. So, so you've got linear A and linear B. Linear mm. B um, has been uh, translated. Linear A has not. Um, that, so that that is linear A that mm-hmm. you're looking at now, okay. and and uh, and that is linear B. Now, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was looking at it and thinking, really, you can't translate the other one. But um, uh, there was a paper published. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't read it, uh, but I just saw the abstract. Uh, there was a paper published in 2021, and there's a, uh, there is one uh, researcher who thinks that they are actually making headway into finally translating Linear A. Um uh, so it's happening now. In, in terms of uh, you know the extension of your uh, of your question, you know, are there other undeciphered texts? Then yeah, I mean there are various things from the Neolithic that um, you know you can take some of the markings if you like at Scarabray that we know that they were cut there, and we have no idea if they mean anything or if they're just random scratched marks we don't know um there are other texts um uh, undeciphered oh crikey um there's a famous one that um no one's ever yep. been able to decide whether it's yeah, actually it a made-up piece of nonsense um do you remember what it's called 
I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, uh, it's outside mind. our wheelhouse, but, I think. Yeah, it is a bit. But um, <clears throat> but that aside, <clears throat> I think that there is so much that we can learn from stuff. That so, for example, British Museum, the British Museum have still got something like four thousand Babylonian tablets that have not yet been translated. They can oh, translate them. They've yeah. just got that many to work through. Um, so the stuff that we still have to learn. Matt, bye-bye. Uh, Matt, thank you for being yourself. with us. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks for your support and all. Uh, yeah, thank you very go much. do what I have steam engine to prep for the weekend. <laughs> oh, my God, you of, do that. Of course you do. Well done. Wow. Yes. Respect. <laughs> go well. Uh, that's very good. Yeah. Have a good one. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, does that even answer the question? Uh, the, the, the fact that there are people who say they are uh, making headway into translating Linear A, I think is quite interesting. Um, what was the rest of your question? My question? No. What, um, <laughs> oh, what was the, the, the last bit of the question? Yeah. Uh, the crux of the question. Because it was the, the the Minoan bit was, uh, you know, that's a straightforward answer. Yes, we can translate B. No, we can't translate A. Um, mm. God, we're ending this show on a damp squib, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry, uh, my screen went bl totally blank there for a moment, so I was a bit... Uh... A bit concerned. I thought you'd lost you. Pros, lost we are all. pros. Hard pros. pros. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking it is we have hit the two-hour mark. No wonder, uh, Lazin. No wonder the Matt is actually uh, disappearing. I'm full of respect for the people that are still with us. Uh, amazing, so, amazing. Yeah, you people I, need no, to get I, out. What or? I was trying to do, Rupert, was get the uh, original question back so so that. Uh, Yes, you could uh, say it's from uh, Benjamin. You know, and what are thoughts uh, and, and what are the thoughts and developments yeah. in this? But yeah, <clears throat> yeah. L like um, I say, not our speciality. Uh, this one, so uh, forgive us the rather no. uh, rambling and and waffly answer. We are obviously losing the plot at this time. It being ten to ten here, and uh, ten to eleven where you are. And, you, and the night is but it young is. for you. Yes, you're going to disappear off into the night, aren't you? Uh, I am. <clears throat> uh, guys, 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 thank you so much for loads of fascinating questions. James, thank you particularly for being with us. Uh, yes, as always. And, thank you so much, and, James. And, uh, good fun. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, giving us your, your wisdom. Uh, thanks as ever again to our Patreon supporters, those of you who've made donations to tonight and will be. And uh, you know, uh, wow, you the difference it makes is just uh, fantastic and it enables us huge. to, yeah, yeah, hmm. to, to, to be do this and to, to make do the other thing we do, which is the making of the films. Um, hmm. so with that, I will say, tar half an hour from, from me. It's a, yeah, and it's a tear off from me, and, uh, and goodbye from me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, folks, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Bye it won't bye be far me. away. Bye.